Well, good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, for several weeks now, the Orlando Economic Partnership has been working around the clock on this, uh, this crisis and trying to support as many small businesses as we can. I think we all know during this pandemic, uh, those on the front lines are our healthcare workers, and, and we're certainly glad to have just excellent healthcare systems here in Central Florida. But this has also become um, a significant economic issue. Uh, over the last week, we've surveyed small businesses to get our arms around and to be able to provide policymakers insights into what small businesses are dealing with. We know that 74% of companies uh, who took the survey are feeling negative impacts from the crisis, and 76% um, are experiencing decline in profits already. Uh, we know that um, small businesses, those with uh, 100 or less employees, account for nearly two thirds of all employment in Orlando. So uh, we're obviously very concerned and, and wanting to provide resources, which is the reason for the call this morning. And we know that most small businesses need the help right now. In fact, about 50% of those that took the survey um, need answers and solutions within the first eight weeks um, based on their cash position. So that's why we wanted to offer uh, this call this morning to go over the CARES Act before uh, businesses uh, are laying off or furloughing employees, it's really important to understand what the CARES Act did because it's, it's prescribed to try to keep small businesses afloat and could keep people on the payroll during this pandemic. So it's, it's great that you uh, part participated this morning to learn about the CARES Act. We think it's the best tool available currently to help small businesses and right now, I'd like to turn things over to Mayor Buddy Dyer. He's obviously led our community through a number of crises, and he's going to help to share some light on how we can ensure a swift economic recovery and provide resources to the small businesses in our community. So I'll turn it to you, Mayor. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. And I want to thank you, Tim, for allowing us to use the partnership platform to host this update for our businesses. And you're right, as I reflect on the time since I've been mayor, our community's been through together. We've had multiple hurricanes with devastating destruction. We had the Great Recession about a decade ago that solidified our need to continue diversifying our economy. Of course, we had the Pulse nightclub tragedy that took 49 innocent lives in one night. But following each of these challenges, our communities come together with love and compassion and ultimately come out more stronger more united, and here in Orlando, that's exactly what we are known for. Um, I know that we'll respond in the same manner to this pandemic um, that's arrived here in our hometown. Um, there's many fronts that we are fighting the pandemic on. There's the medical perspective, there's the emotional and community resilience perspective, and of course, what we're talking about this morning is the economic perspective. And it's hard to imagine how drastically this virus has impacted our daily lives, our businesses, our economy, our community health. And we know that uh, there are few, probably no industry or business that's immune from this virus. And as we know, as a business leader, you've had to make some tough decisions on behalf of your businesses already, on your employees. As a city, we've made some tough and aggressive decisions to stop the spread, we deem that to be the most important thing. So the quicker we can flatten the curve and shut the virus down, the faster we can reopen our economy and get on the path to recovery. Um, and helping our economy recover will take partnership from all levels of government at city alongside the Orlando Economic Partnership. We'll continue to fight for you in every way that we can, advocate for you and make sure that you have the most up-to-date information. There's several resources that are already out there. The Orlando Economic Partnership's COVID-19 Resource Center, the Small Business Emergency Bridge Loan, the SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And today, you're, we're gonna be providing you with information on the $2 trillion CARES Act that was just signed into law. So I wanna express my gratitude to our friends at Align Public Affairs, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Joe and Franklin in just a minute. Before I do, I want to thank you, our business leaders and our small business community. You're the backbone of our economy, and I want to thank you for your dedication to our city, 
and our commitment, your commitment to our region. We're going to get through this together and we'll be stronger on the other side. So Joe and Franklin, take it away. Thanks, Mayor, uh, and thanks, Tim, uh, for putting this, uh, this webinar together today, and I uh, appreciate your, your leadership in this time, and as, as always, you are uh, a great leader at all times, and especially at crisis times, and it's, it's nice to know that you're in control here. Um, I wanted to, before we start going into the details of the bill, I wanted to give a broad overview of the context of the legislation, the intent of the of the president and the Congress when they wrote this bill and kind of give a, a broader overview of, of why they've approached the bill and the way they have. So when Franklin goes into the details of the bill, you'll have the, the kind of context and what the, uh, the legislative teams were thinking when they put this together. It, as, as the mayor alluded, this is, this is the, uh, the CARES Act is the third of three, so far three coronavirus related pieces of legislation. If you remember, about three weeks ago, the first bill was passed and it was really focused on the healthcare community getting uh, necessary monies and equipment to first responders and hospitals and shoring up our ability to address uh, the, the virus, both from an epidemiological uh, perspective and a medical perspective. The second uh, piece of legislation that was passed was passed about two weeks ago and it was much more uh, individual and family facing. You may remember that uh, in that bill were extensions of paid family medical leave and paid sick leave benefits. And that was the focus of, of that particular piece of legislation. This is the third. And it's important to understand the CARES Act, the R in the CARES Act stands for relief. And it's important to understand in context that this bill is not intended to be an economic stimulus package. This bill is not intended to jumpstart the economy or some segment of the economy. This is very much a short-term focused relief bill looking for the next weeks and months to help um, keep individuals employed to the largest extent possible, to keep the lights on at home, to keep bills paid for small businesses, to keep the doors open, the lights on, and most importantly, and we'll keep coming back to this throughout the presentation, and Tim alluded to this as well, keeping people on the payroll. So the, 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 the loan provisions of this bill, the tax provisions, it's all about keeping as many people on the payroll as possible. And again, it's a short-term fix. It's very likely that Congress may have to come back in the June, July window and do a similar type of, type of bill. In fact, they're already working on coronavirus four and potentially five in Washington as we speak. So understanding that the intent of the legislation is, is short-term liquidity. Um, it's also important to understand that this, that this legislation is very much a work in progress. For those that are um, familiar with the congressional legislative process, this is an over 1,000-page piece of legislation. And it, um, in, in normal circumstances, might take a year or two years for a bill of this magnitude to make it through the legislative process. And then it may take a year or two years to write all the rules and regulations around the bill, the rulemaking process. This massive piece of legislation was drafted, debated, and passed in a, in a matter of days and weeks, in about two weeks. And the rulemaking process, the normal uh, Administrative Procedures Act and rulemaking process has been uh, uh, suspended, and they are making rules on an emergency basis. And every day, uh, this bill passed last Friday out of the U.S. House. The president signed it later that afternoon. So we're in the sixth day of this bill, and every single day, more guidance has come out from the Department of Treasury and the Small Business Administration. So it's very much a work in progress. Uh, more clarity will come out by the day. So if, if, in, in coronavirus four that they're debating now, or drafting now, I should say, we'll have technical corrections for this bill. This particular bill has a lot of technical corrections for coronavirus two. So understanding that there's not perfect clarity in what's been, um, what's been passed so far, and the agencies are working to, to provide that clarity as much as possible in the rulemaking process, which I say is, is going on every day. As such, um, this, this webinar is not intended to be uh, legal advice, financial advice. Um, we, we, we strongly urge you to get with your local counsel, your accountants, your lenders to understand uh, all the possibilities and, and options we're going to lay out today, what works best for your business. So this is not financial advice, but it's just 
understanding what's in this bill, how it's supposed to work, what you may be eligible so that you can go to your local teams and understand what's best for your particular business. All right, so having laid all that out, uh, there are three major buckets of the, of, the, of the bill before I pass it off to Franklin. Part one, and we'll probably spend the most amount of time in that today, is around the loans of the Small Business Administration, somewhat of the Treasury Department, but mostly Small Business Administration, uh, new loan programs, enhancing existing loan programs, different, uh, more generous payback terms, some, some debt forgiveness terms. So there's a whole bucket of different types of loans now available to small business people. Again, for liquidity's sake, to keep business, keep money in the hands of small business operators so they can keep people on the payroll. The second piece of, of, of this particular bill that's important to small business owners is the individual and employee assistance piece. So you need to understand as your employees what options they have, what, what sources of relief are available to them. In a, so you can make an informed business decision. As the mayor said, you've got some tough decisions you've already had to make. You've got more tough decisions coming your way in terms of layoffs or furloughs or there's a potential in some places where people could make more on unemployment than they could staying employed. So all those factors will come into play and as business owners. You need to know that so you can do the best possible job for your employees. And the third piece, of course, is the tax credit piece. And the tax credit, again, all the changes to tax law are about liquidity, keeping money inside the four walls of the business instead of remitting sales tax and payroll taxes back to the government that may come back to you in six, 12 months. How do we change and law now to keep as much money inside the building as possible now. So those are the three big buckets, the loan program, the more employee facing stuff, and the tax credit bucket. And so with that, Franklin, I'm going to pass it off to you to A, correct the things that I've said wrong, enhance, or just get started in the loan program. So I'll pass it off to you. Sure. Hey, Franklin, I'm going to do a quick interception here. Um, one thing we forgot to mention at the top was um, using Zoom at the bottom, there's a Q&A function. So make sure if, if you have questions to ask at, at any point, um, we're best able to kind of uh, moderate that, if you will, through the Q&A function in Zoom. So please take advantage of that. Sorry, Franklin, uh, wanted to get that out there. No problem. Yeah, it was a good tee up, uh, Joe. And I would highlight just a couple things there that, yeah, this is, we are, basing our analysis on what's in the legislation. The agency is going to clarify these rules. We were doing a webinar on Saturday midday when the idle application went live. We were doing a webinar on Wednesday when the Paycheck Protection Program application went live. So all this is happening very quickly. Uh, federal agencies and lawmakers are doing, that, doing it that way so that they can get money to you and to your workers as quickly as possible. So things are, are, are changing by the minute, by the day. We're going to give you the broad, broad contours of the program, but you're going to need to follow up with your teams, both internal and external, to work through some of the specific details. Um, so we're going to talk through, as Joe said, loans, tax relief, and then talk about how workers are directly being assisted. What's important to know as we begin this conversation, and these is that these programs are designed to work side by side, not overlap. So you can access the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program. You can access the Small Business's Emergency Injury Disaster Loan Idle Program, and you can access some of these tax credits, but they all have to be siloed. They cannot pay for the same thing. So you can't pull down multiple loans to pay payroll. You have to use one loan to pay payroll and one loan to pay overhead and et cetera, et cetera. So as we roll through all these potential options, you have to think through it that way that you're gonna potentially side by side some of these programs. And the big choice that you're gonna face in that regard is between choosing the SBA loan, the Paycheck Protection Program, which we're gonna talk about first and probably spend more time on than anything else because that's what most people are interested in, or the Employee Retention Tax Credit, the ERTC, which we will talk about later in the tax relief section. Both of these programs are specifically designed to lift some of the burden of you of payroll. And so you can't double them up 
in terms of focusing on payroll cost. Um, so we're going to get in the details of both these programs, but I wanted to set that up from the beginning. So as you're thinking through how you're going to potentially access and use these programs, you know that you, you got to really get down with your number two pencil and your calculator and, and your teams and really get deep into the details of these. So with that, let's, let's dive into the business loan section first. So SBA, as uh, I think Tim mentioned, has a ton of loans. Um, and we're going to focus on two that specifically were given a lot of money through the CARES Act. But just know, you can reach out to the SBA for an emergency bridge loan or for a variety of other loans at any point, and I encourage you to look at all those options. But the two we're going to talk about are the, the programs that were given $350 million through this legislation to excuse me, $350 billion through this legislation to expand dramatically. And that is the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL program, that's DC Talk, it's EIDL loans, that's Economic Injury Disaster Loans. So first, Paycheck Protection Program. First, we're gonna talk about who qualifies, then we'll touch on the process, we'll come back to that at the end. We'll talk about the loan amount you can get and then the most important, or what you, and what you can spend it on, and then I think the most important part is how you get it forgiven, because you can get this entire loan completely forgiven if you spend it on specified purposes, namely payroll. Um, hence the name, Paycheck Protection Program. So to qualify, you have to show economic harm due to COVID-19, and as Tim was referencing earlier in his survey, I think it was 74% of businesses surveyed had some negative impact. So a lot of you, a lot of the folks in our community are going to qualify for this program. The threshold is you have to be a small business under the definition, 500 or less employees, and you have to have supply chain disruptions um, or staffing challenges, decrease in customer sales, business closure that could be partial or full business closure which we certainly experienced the hospitality industry is treated a little bit differently under this program hotels and restaurants and affiliated businesses um, were hit particularly hard and particularly early and so the way it works within the hospitality industry is the affiliation rules are waived is the exact language and what that means is if you are part of a larger chain or system, you are treated as a, by single location. And so you have to have 500 or less employees per location, not part of a, the larger chain. So let's say you're a franchise operator with seven stores in the East Coast employing 700 people, you know, 100 employees per store, each location would effectively qualify for this program. There, um, it also focuses on uh, 501c3 organizations, which is unique and new. Typically, 501c3s cannot pursue loans through the SBA. Um, and then there's a couple other veterans organizations and uh, tribal entities. But the, the big exclusions are, um, you know, chambers of commerce, labor unions, um, education or advocacy organizations, C4s. Uh, C6s, C7s, et cetera. So pretty, pretty wide pool. Um, now, applying, and we're going to touch back to this, the process. What does the process look like? So you're an eligible business and you want to go get these monies. How do you actually go about doing it? Well, as I mentioned, the application is up online now. So you can access that application and start flipping through it. I would encourage you to do that. The way that this program is going to work, though, is you're going to submit that application through a local lender that is in partnership with the Small Business Administration. And essentially what they're doing is they're adding this program onto an existing program called the 7A Loan Program. So the SBA has lenders across the country. And if you just Google Orlando Business Journal and SBA lenders, a list of lenders will come up in the market. And in fact, SBA is throwing open the floodgates and low in qualification. So basically any bank or financial institution that wants to participate can. So I'd encourage you to reach out to your existing lenders, look at that list of lenders in the market. You're going to have to submit the loan application through them. And obviously they're gonna work with you on the particulars 
Um, we're going to do the broad strokes today. They will work with you on the particulars of ensuring you fill out the application properly. I have noticed within the past 24 hours, these applications have started popping up on the websites of financial institutions around the country with details on how to fill them out. So that is step one in the process. Reach out to your lender. Getting into the loan amount that you will qualify for. There's a formula to calculate this loan amount. It's 2.5 times your average monthly payroll. So that's 250% of your average monthly payroll. That's the total loan amount. The average monthly payroll, it should be in the document here, I think if we scroll down a little bit, is gonna be determined by averaging payroll you'll get to choose from two date ranges. And that's set up in case you're a seasonal business. So essentially you're talking about, uh, I think it was January 1 through uh, March of this year or um, a chunk of last year, I think beginning on February 15th, it should be enumerated in the document. But essentially a 12 month period or the, the first part of this year, that's gonna give you your average payroll costs. Now, what can you include in there? Obviously you know, payroll, but other forms of compensation can be included too. Um, the, the thinking is that a lot of people are gonna try to drive up that number as high as possible. So you can put tips in there if you choose to, you can put benefits in there, you can count a number of things in there to kind of drive that number up. And you get, again, that will be enumerated um, in the document and your lender's gonna know this stuff. So, the thought is that people are going to try to push that loan amount as high as possible. It will be capped at $10 million. Um, so pretty good loan. Um, now the approved purposes that you can spend that on are pretty narrow. It's going to essentially be payroll and compensation for employees. And we're going to talk about loan forgiveness, how you get that, that debt wiped away. Um, and, and that's really where you want to spend the bulk of the money. It's what it's designed to do. So payroll, but you can also spend it on utilities, rent, and um, some mortgage obligations. Yet again, that's going to be uh, enumerated. So the next part and the most, I think, important part is the loan forgiveness. How do you get this wiped away? As the name would suggest, if you spend it all on payroll, you're going to get it wiped away. Once you start coming off of that and spending on other things or laying off workers and not paying workers, then the debt forgiveness is going to come down and that amount is going to turn into a traditional loan. And the, the, um, the rates, I think it's 4%, I think it's 10 years deferred payments for a year, but all that will be in the document here. You can, you can look at that. It's, it's a pretty favorable loan essentially. Um, but anything that is not forgiven just transitions into a traditional loan. So how do you get this amount forgiven? And we need a little more guidance from the agencies on this, but here's, here's roughly how it's gonna look. There's gonna be a grace period. So if you've laid off or furloughed workers, there will be a grace period for you to rehire them or bring them back on board um, at full employment. You are gonna be graded own once the clock starts, once the loan is originated, you're going to be graded over the subsequent eight week period on keeping all your employees or some portion thereof own payroll and how much is forgiven be graded during that eight week period. So as I said, to get full forgiveness, you want to keep all your, your people in payroll. Um, and the way the legislative language reads is for everyone employee that falls off, the amount will be reduced proportionally. Um, and we don't know exactly what that formula is going to look like. So here's where you really got to work with your lender. Um, the calculation, the way the legislation is written is you would think that it would be full-time equivalents based off of the ACA language. So if you have a lot of part-time workers, there essentially there's a formula in federal statute in the ACA healthcare legislation that you can calculate how part-time workers add up to full-time workers. The application itself says jobs. It doesn't use that. In fact, the application uses a different definition for full-time 
uh, workers in the paid leave section. So you need to work through that with your lender, how you're going to treat part-time workers. Do they add up to a full-time equivalent? Um, that is one section that we're hoping to get additional guidance on in the coming days. That's going to be important because it's going to reduce proportionally. So you have to spend at least 75% of this loan own employee payroll for full forgiveness. Anything below that, you're going to reduce your amount. And yet again, the approved purposes were utilities, rent, some mortgage obligations, and payroll. So that is really the broad strokes of the Paycheck Protection Program. The most important piece I'll re reiterate is the process. Pull together your paperwork. Get your average monthly payroll together. Start thinking through um, getting that calculation. Find a lender. Pull down the application. And uh, Joe, before I hand back to you, there's one other thing that I, I skipped over that I want to highlight because this may be important to some of the listeners. If you are a business owner and you take compensation from your uh, small business, you count into that amount. Now, you, you essentially, you can count yourself and pay yourself. It's unclear if you, do, if you do salary, it's unclear exactly how if you take a draw or you, know, you take irregular payments or you pay another LLC that's your management company, it's unclear exactly how that will work. Clearly those payments need to be annualized and, but they can potentially be counted in. Not exactly sure, you're gonna have to work with your lender through that piece. I would also say that some independent contractors can also, if they're on your property, um, and they, they purposely, legislators person, purposely cast the net wide in this regard. Um, if you're kind of, if they're operating kind of like an employee, you can count them in and pay them. And that goes towards the calculation and the forgiveness. Um, these are other key points, just anticipating questions that are going to come up, um, that you're going to need to work through your lender, but there's some, um, allowances in there. Uh, Joe, what, what did I miss here? I didn't miss anything. I think what I would what I would just um, uh, emphasize is, uh, you know, this is while it's a massive amount of money that has been appropriated to these loan programs, it is a very finite amount of money, and it's not clear uh, the next time Congress revisits this particular space later in the summer, if needed, that there will be a whole lot of extra money to put into this thing. So it's a finite amount of money, and so uh, you, you need to get your paper if, if you haven't already. Uh, when this webinar ends, you need to get your paperwork together and kind of get in line uh, with your local lender. Franklin, I believe uh, this goes live tomorrow, uh, April 3rd, uh, this piece of it. Um, and so I think it's important that, that people understand that they, they, they can't kind of, uh, they can't lollygag on this and have to get their, their paperwork in order to get in the front of the line. Uh, yeah. And the, yes, you're right, Joe, that's, that's a great, Point. The application period opens tomorrow, April 3rd, for small businesses. For independent contractors, sole proprietors, April 10th. Um, so if you're filing as a, an independent contractor, um, then, then April 10th will be your deadline. So a, a couple quick questions. We will try to get back to all these questions towards the end, but I'm seeing a couple things that I, I skipped over quickly. There is a $100,000 annual compensation cap in the loan amount calculation. So if you have employees that are getting paid over $100,000, that amount is capped, but you can add it into your loan calculation amount. But on the back end, in terms of debt forgiveness, you cannot count those employees in. And the idea here is that, you know, we're legislators and the agencies are, are trying to help kind of frontline workers. And so, so you can get, you can put that in and, and up your amount, um, your total amount for the loan you can receive, but it's going to make you hard to get all that forgiven on the back end. That's probably, that piece is probably going to transition into a, uh, a uh, loan. Um, in terms of enumerating what can be included in the calculations and in the back end, that's in this document. You're going to find that with your lender, but essentially it, it gives some latitude to include um, both in the calculation, not in the back end and the forgiveness side, but it gives some latitude in the calculation side and what you want to include in there. And there's different benefits, tips, et cetera, that you can, 
you can count in. Um, Frank, can I, let me add one thing also, just in terms of managing expectations as, as folks go to talk to their lenders, you know, there's still a, an education process that has to happen between the small business administration and those lending institutions. Many, you know, have, haven't had previous relationships with the SBA. Um, and so uh, different parts of the country, we've been talking to business owners and operators that, you know, are, are reaching out to their lenders and their lenders are telling them they haven't quite gotten all the guidance in the inf- need out of the SBA. So be prepared. That may be the case. Even more reason to kind of get your paperwork, you know, in order as fast as possible. Yeah. And I'm getting questions about 1099 and investors. And this is where we kind of start getting into gray area. But the way the, the legislation is specifically written to allow for independent contractors. And I heard um, an SBA staff member yesterday in a, a conference call use the example of a guitar player in a restaurant that, um, is, uh, you know, is there every night and is playing guitar and is an independent contractor that that person could be included um, the way the legislation was written. Yet again, we don't have the agency interpretation yet, but the way the legislation was written, that person would be included. So um, I think you need to kind of prepare that, you know, some of these independent contractors can be included in this and then work with your lender to work through the specifics. In terms of investors and owners and distributions, that is kind of, it's, it's unclear at this point. Certainly you want to, it, it, certainly the calculation needs to be annualized. So if you take quarterly bonuses and they, they fluctuate, you need an annualized um, number for that average monthly payroll. And it may be included, it may not. You get to work with your lender uh, on those specifics. Um, Joe, anything else before we move on? And we will come back and try to address all these questions that are flooding in right now. Now, let's, let's, let's move. Keep it, keep it going. Okay. Um, so the other big program, the new program for SBA, actually it's not a new program. The expansion on an existing program is the IDLE program. And that is the emergency, uh, excuse me, economic inter- injury disaster loan program. Existing program, you could have applied for it two weeks ago. The novelty now, the thing that has changed now, well, one, it's got a lot more funding, but two, if you submit an application for an EIDL loan, E-I-D-L loan right now, you get, the way the legislation reads, within three days, a check for $10,000. And if this is spent on specified purposes, which... um, it's pretty broad, you know, it's basically overhead costs, you know, you can't put it in, you know, your pocket as an owner, right? You've got to, you've got to spend it on payroll and overhead costs, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty wide, uh, wide range of things you can spend it on. Then that is 100%, I forget, it basically comes a grant. It's a $10,000 grant sent to you within three days. Yet again, as Joe said earlier, this is intended to provide immediate liquidity for small businesses. Now, this program, anything beyond that that $10,000 just becomes a traditional loan. And you're talking about a a loan up to $2 million. Um, And they're pretty favorable terms are in there. I think it's 3.75% interest rate. Um, And yet again, this is traditional loans, so wider uses, there's not as narrow contours as um, with the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, For this program, as for these other programs, they're really throwing up, open the gates to um, both lenders and to borrowers. So there's no collateral obligations. There's no underwriting here. These are 100% backed by the U.S. government. If you apply, essentially, I, I think there's, you have to put your, your credit score in, but that's about it. There's no personal guarantee. <clears throat> There's no credit elsewhere requirement, which are, is kind of typical of SBA loans. So <clears throat> the intent here, and I think this was stated by legislators during the process, is to get money to businesses that have no money. So, you know, the expectation is businesses are not going to be able to demonstrate that they're going to be able to repay this. And this is intended, particularly the $10,000 grant to keep the lights on. Whether or not your loan application is approved, you will receive the $10,000 grant 
if you apply for the IDA loan. So, and if you do them, and as Joe said earlier, these programs have been appropriated a lot of money, but it's not an infinite pool. And if you just kind of back the napkin, do the math, a million businesses could go and get that $10,000 grant and this program would be out of money. The expectation, the hope is if there's an overwhelming response and these, these programs are utilized, that Congress is going to come back and appropriate more money for them, but there's no guarantee. So again, you should get in the front of the line to the degree you can to apply for this loan if this is something you're interested in. Now, we talked earlier, and this is where it's tricky. You cannot pull down the Paycheck Protection Program loan and use that for payroll and then also go get an idle loan and use that for payroll. So you can access both loans, but they have to be for different purposes. So you could pull down an idle loan to cover some overhead and pull down the Paycheck Protection Program to cover payroll, but you can't double them up. You also, um, and you need to work with your lender in this and, and be very careful, but if you already have an idle loan, and we've talked to a number of, of operators that already have pulled down idle loans, you can roll it into the Paycheck Protection Program, but it's unclear exactly when that cutoff will be. Um, the application period for the Paycheck Protection Program opens tomorrow, and so you need to be very careful if your game plan is to try to access one of these idle loans and roll it in that, you know, you, you just need to work with your lender to ensure you're doing that properly. Um, this is, I think both of these programs are going to be very popular. These are the two biggest programs that were created and funded by the CARES Act. To Joe's point earlier, the decision that legislators were looking at is how do we put money in American workers' pockets? Well, we're going to do it by putting a lot of funding into unemployment insurance, and we're going to talk about that later. And we're going to do it by putting a lot of money into small businesses across the country with the hope and expectation that it's going to incentivize and help businesses keep people on the payroll. And so American workers will get money that way. Uh, so with that, I'll take a pause, Joe, do a uh, clean up and let me know what I missed. You didn't miss anything. You didn't miss anything. I, I, I think the, 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 the one point I want to raise for folks, and again, uh, keep harkening back to clarity coming in the rulemaking process is there will be, you know, uh, stipulations about quote unquote double dipping. If, if you use, if you leverage the Paycheck Protection Program, you may be eligible for some or all part of the IDLE program, potentially not vice versa. If you use both of those, and I know you'll go to this in the tax section, Franklin, you, if you use leverage both of these loan programs, you may not be eligible for some of the tax credits. So there's a, you need to make sure that you're not in any situation where you're kind of double dipping inappropriately out of these things. And so again, working with your local teams to navigate that space, because while while the amounts of money are generous and the terms are generous and the rules are very loose, they will not be generous when, if, if people are, are not uh, accessing it properly. So I just wanted to add that piece. I see one important question. Um, <clears throat> the idle loan is not going to go through local lenders. That is going to go straight through the SBA. And so that application is up on the SBA's website. The link is actually in this document. Um, and, but if you're going to also pursue the Paycheck Protection Program, you're working with your local lender, I would talk to them about the idle loan if you're going to do that as well and make sure, to Joe's point, that you're using them properly in concert and not overlapping them in a, in a way that is disallowed. So, Franklin, we're, we're kind of running up on time here. Do you want to move on to, I know you can go through this section fairly quickly, but you want yeah. to get the, the kind of the more employee-facing thing. And again, the context for this is you know these are the challenges that that and the opportunities that that your employees uh, have out there and, and and knowing this piece will help you make better decisions when it comes to as the mayor said earlier laying off people keeping people furloughing people what may be the best interest of your employees so uh, I just want to tee that up uh, again Franklin sure and then we'll do the tax relief at the at the very end here um, which is going to stack up beside some of the loan programs but yeah in terms of worker assistance yet again. Congress want to put money right in U.S. workers' hands immediately, and they're doing it by giving you money to pay them, or they're doing it through the unemployment insurance program um, and sending them checks directly. So within the coming weeks, every worker, excuse me, every U.S. resident that earned under $75,000 will get a $1,200 check. 
So that will add up uh, for a household of two to $2,400 plus $500 additional for every child. If you earn above 75,000 up to 99,000, then it will be a sliding scale down. I don't know the exact formula, but you'll get some portion of $1,200. Um, and the same thing, I think there's three levels for household income, combined income, it's a sliding scale. Um, so you can look at that. Those checks are gonna be done just like a uh, tax refund. The treasury is probably running the checks right now. They'll drop them in the mail. And that will be a real lifeline um, for workers across the country. Additionally, the unemployment insurance program will be stretched to 39 weeks and 600 additional dollars per week will be appropriated for those on unemployment. That's gonna differ by state. And I don't know the exact um, calculation here in the state of Florida, but there could be some circumstances where workers, um, entry-level workers, frontline workers, particularly if they're not being scheduled to come in and work or they're you know, furloughed, they could potentially make more through this bolstered uh, unemployment insurance program than they would if they were not being scheduled for shifts or staying at home. So this is um, a tough decision for you know, employers and employees you know, to, to kind of work through this. The whole idea of the Paycheck Protection Program is even if you're not scheduling or even if your business is closed, that you're going to pay workers to keep them on payroll and maintain that relationship with your worker um, rather than having them go onto the unemployment insurance roles. But look, you know, th this is something you've got to kind of think through. The other consideration I would throw in the mix here um, is that, you know, if maybe a worker is going to make more on unemployment insurance, but they may lose health care, right? So, you know, you've got to just kind of think through all these things, do what's um, best for the employee and best for the business. And I know these are really tough decisions um, for everyone right, right now. now. So that's, that's the worker assistance. I, I think the main thing here, Joe, is you just need to know that there's other stuff going on out there and workers are going to be getting monies. And, um, you know, that's the broader context in which you're making some of these decisions in. And I would just add, um, you know, what we're seeing across the country, this is a space that the states themselves uh, are getting very active in. And we've seen, uh, you know, the governor of New Jersey last week signed a whole new package of benefits uh, into law. It's happening in New York, Illinois, California, a lot of the big states. I, once, you know, I assume that once we get through the, 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 the bulk of our crisis situation here in Florida, that our legislature and governor will, will reconvene its, and work a lot of state-related assistance programs as well to complement what's happening federally. So just keep your eyes out for that as well at some point down the road. I think the last bucket is tax relief. Joe, do you want to tee that up or you want me to just- Yeah, add I, would just, I would just add that, you know, again, the same, the same theory of keeping as much money inside the full walls of the operation as quickly as possible, as liquid as possible. So they're not remitting taxes out for and waiting for, you know, credits and uh, rebates to come back. And so there've been a lot of tweaks uh, to, to tax law that have been, uh, again, designed about immediate liquidity, again, keeping people on payroll. And there have been some other things that the business community has been working on for a long time. And Franklin will, will speak to that. Um, some tax changes that got put in as uh, that, that, that got put into this particular bill that are important to all small business owners. So, Frank, I think we can go through this section pretty quick and then get on to the Q&A because the, the yep. Q&A panel is, is stacking up there. Yeah, so we're, we're going to buzz through this. This gets really specific for each business operation, too. So um, we're going to outline it, but you're going to have to get, you know, dive in deep in this and, and figure out what works for you. We're going to go through the big federal tax relief pieces, but as Joe mentioned, there's state and local tax relief pieces that also need to be, you know, factored in and considered. So um, the biggest one is the employee retention tax credit. And this is a little bit different than the SBA programs in that I think it has a higher threshold for qualification. Essentially, you have to demonstrate that you had a 50% uh, drop in gross receipts or your operation has been fully or partially shut down, which I know the full slash, particularly the partial shutdown is gonna cover a lot of businesses in this area, but you're gonna to have to demonstrate that to 
qualify for the tax credit. This is a refundable payroll tax credit for up to 50% of wages. So 50% of wages. Now there's a hundred employee split here. So if you have less than a hundred employees, all wages. If you have more than a hundred employees, it's only COVID-19 related work stoppages, essentially. Um, this is capped at the first $10,000 of expenses per, um, and this runs March 13th through the remainder of the year. So essentially March 13th is when things started to gear up and this crisis really started to impact American businesses. So that is the big program. That's the one you really want to look at because if you're going to go this route, then you're not going to go the paycheck protection program route. And so you kind of got to choose a branch, you know, a, a break in the road here. Um, the other thing, I don't think we have it in here because it was the second relief bill, but there were, there was cleanup in this bill, but there's a tax credit for paid leave. If you're utilizing that tax credit for paid leave, which I suspect most people are, um, that was in the second relief bill, then you also can't double up paycheck protection program to this. You have to silo each one of these programs and benefits. Um, so that is that one. That's a big one. Some of the other ones I'm just going to buzz through. Delay in the payroll taxes, as Joe said, this is designed, instead of your sitting on stuff and send it to the government way to get back, you can just automatically access it for liquidity. Modification of net operational losses. The importance of this is going to just going to differ widely by business, but it's clearly something you need to look at. The quip fix um, for the people we work with the most, the hospitality industry, this is a huge deal. This is something that we have been trying to get for two years, essentially, since um, the tax cuts went through. There was a technical error in there, and this is the correction that fixes that. And essentially, um, this is qualified uh, improvement property, so the quip, um, and there were over 200 sponsors of this in the U.S. House as standalone legislation. But what this allows for is any improvements to property over the past two years can essentially be immediately written off because this legislation is passed. So you need to amend your prior tax returns immediately and get that into the IRS so that um, you can get money back. So that's a big one. That's a, been a huge one for um, the retail and restaurant industries in particular and it may apply to you. And that, that could be another pot of money that you can get pretty quickly. Um, so with that, those are the big pieces of, uh, of tax relief. I'm gonna say one last thing, Joe, and then we can start, buzz, start buzzing through the questions here, but there's state and local stuff going on too. Your power company may be deferring you know, payments. Your landlord or your bank may be allowing you to defer. There's essentially zero interest loans right there. So you know, you have to lay all this stuff out together side by side, because if you're getting a deferral on your mortgage payment or your rent or, or your power bill and utilities, that's a zero interest loan. Move that away. Don't get an idle loan for that or, you know, your paycheck protection loan. Then you can put all that towards payroll and not worry about rent utilities. So there's a whole universe. We're giving you the broad strokes of the big pieces, but there's a whole universe of programs out there because policymakers everywhere are focused on helping you stay, keep the lights on and keep your folks employed and everyone's going to continue to focus on that. So um, with that, Joe, maybe we, we punch it over and look at some questions. Yeah, I just had one thing. Policymakers are, are in all levels of government, all sides of the political spectrum are incredibly invested in this. And so um, there, there has been no time uh, where there's been a greater understanding of, of the fragility of many of the small business models out there you know two or three months ago you know we had businesses turning along having record years and now they're boarded up and, and it happened in a matter of weeks and so i think there's a, a broad understanding of policymakers across the spectrum of how critical this piece is how invested so if things as you go through this process and things are the sba program isn't working right or you're not getting clarity on this piece you know you've got to reach out to you know your members of congress because, because they are 100% listening and invested in this, reach out to Stephanie Murphy or Val Demings or whoever your member of Congress is, Rick Scott, Mark Rubio, reach out to Tim and Sharon and their team to help voice that as well. Because they're, they're listening, they're, they're incredibly invested in this and they want to get it, they, they've all got to get it right. 
uh, for a lot of obvious reasons. So, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a time to be very active and engaged with that process. They need to hear from you about what's going well, what's not going well. So I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would sum it up with that. And, and Frank, if you have anything to add, we'll go right to the Q&A. I see we're up to almost 100 questions now. Some of them have been done. You want to just kind of pick some of the ones yeah. that you're seeing uh, being repeated so we can make sure we touch on those. Yeah. Um, so hotels, restaurants, hospitality industry, it is per location, not per system. Less than 500 employees per location. You are treated differently than any other business in the country in that regard. Furloughed employees right now, there's going to be a grace period. So the whole program, Paycheck Protection Program, runs through June 30th. The exact dates, you got to work with your lender. We don't have total clarity on this, but there is going to be a grace period to bring your workers back on and count them towards your loan forgiveness amount. Tipped employees, yes, you can count their tips in, but you got to be careful if you're going to if you're going to count their average wage with their tips or some portion of their tips in the loan amount you're pulling down, then that kind of sets the, um, the, uh, the standard, if you will, on the back end and the forgiveness. So you got to just make sure you're, you're careful about that. But I think a lot of, uh, a lot of folks to the extent they can are probably going to include tips in there and then pay their workers um, the tips in addition to the regular wage. Um, so there's a question around hiring new employees for the Paycheck Protection Program. Yet again, this is an area you got to kind of work with your lender, but the expectation is that you're going to keep payroll um, for that eight-week period. That's how you get the loan forgiven. We don't know how this is going to work, but if employees voluntarily leave, right, you would think that the employer wouldn't be dinged for that. And therefore, if you're replacing an employee and bring in a new employee, you're maintaining that level, but you have some turnover. You know, you wouldn't think that employers would get dinged for that, but we don't have clarity around how that's going to work. That's something you're going to have to pay attention to and work with your lender on. Um, someone's asking about unemployment insurance. If someone goes in unemployment, the funding will be there. The, the feds are going to insure it backed up. Um, Joe, are you seeing any other questions here that, that are repeating a lot? Uh, I am seeing some questions about seasonal workers, and I'm not sure we have the answer on that, but there are a lot of employers that have seasonal workers um, that may be either gearing up or gearing down for the sun and how that can be treated. And um, I'm, I'm seeing that in a number of places. Yeah. So the, way the, the, the way they are trying to account for that is by offering the two time periods um, for – in regards to the Paycheck Protection Program, at least, the two time periods. And if your seasonal business is off of, you know, that, that one time period, that may be a challenge. But that's how they're attempting to address that, seasonal employees, is setting that loan amount and then the forgiveness standard based on those two different time periods, which are in the doc. Frank, um, I'm seeing uh, questions about owning multiple businesses. And how will that be handled? Can they apply under each business? Yeah. And um, so, uh, yet again, everyone has very specific questions and we're kind of lacking all the specific rules. So, but the way that it reads, and you have to talk with your lender to ensure this is the case, but the way it reads is going to be per business, regardless of, um, uh, you know, ownership. Now, in terms of uh, compensation to owners, um, that is, that is where you have to work, you know, with your lender and just know that, um, regulators are going to be looking for abuse of these programs. So just, just be careful if you, you have a bunch of entities and you're maxing them out to pay yourself, that is not going to, uh, look good. Um, and so just work with your lender to make sure that you're within the guidelines of the program on that. Frank, um, I'm seeing a number of questions, and we've seen this on every single one of these webinars we've done. Uh, and again, it's, it's a, a lack of clarity because the rules haven't come. But it's this $100,000, if you pay yourself, the $100,000 salary threshold and how they're – can you speak to what we do know and don't know about that? So the $100,000 threshold, the way it's expected that's going to work is there's a cap at $100,000 in terms of – calculating um, the loan amount under the Paycheck Protection Program. But those persons are excluded on the back end in terms of forgiveness. 
And the idea is that the Paycheck Protection Program and, and the forgiveness piece, which is essentially a grant, is the same thing as unemployment insurance, right? They are trying to get money in the pockets of those frontline workers. And if you think of the unemployment insurance program running side by side with this, the cutoff is $99,000. So here the cutoff is $100,000. So really they're focusing whether it's unemployment insurance or the, via the Paycheck Protection Program, they're focused on that $99,000 and down and specific, specifically that $75,000 and down. Um, so that's, that's how that will work. I see a question about idle loans. The max amount is $2 million. Someone's saying they applied for the idle loan last week and they haven't heard back. I suspect that's because they're just overwhelmed and they will hear back soon. You know, technically the rulemaking process was a 10 day emergency process. And I think we hit the 10 day mark. We haven't hit it yet. So um, as soon as we hit that mark, you may get some response and get that grant money. I see, I had this question yesterday, Airbnb host eligible um, for idle. Uh, so you're a, probably a sole proprietor, I, I'm uh, assuming. And there are, you have to seek out um, the, the sole proprietor information in the document here. I do believe that you qualify for idle, but do not quote me on that. Um, I do believe you also can potentially qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, but yet again, don't, don't quote me on that. Wait for further guidance and follow these links to the agency websites. The IDA loan is the same thing as the SBA disaster loan. Um, there are, however, there are other SBA programs, emergency bridge loans um, and other loans. And, and I don't know the names of all those. You'd have to go in and look. But the IDLE loan is an existing program. And just to get the proper name correct, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Frank, on there are a number of questions uh, about 1099 uh, types of employee, you know, independent contractors. I know you, you touched on that earlier. Can you just uh, reiterate your points about how 1099s are treated? Yeah, um, so through the Paycheck Protection Program, if you have a 1099, this is the guitar player example in the restaurant I gave earlier, um, the indication is that you can count them in and, and cover them. Um, if you're a 1099 on your own, and actually this would apply to the Airbnb host as well, um, April 10th is, the, is when you start filing for the Paycheck Protection Program. And like we've said before, you can be an owner in a business, and if you pull a salary out of there, um, you, you can – essentially apply for the Paycheck Protection Program and pay yourself a salary under $100,000, right? Um, and um, it's unclear. If you're, if, you're, if you're pulling a direct salary, that's, that's one thing. If you have a complicated um, corporate structure where you're paying a management company or you're taking a distribution, or that's where it gets a little fuzzy, Clearly, that's going to need to be annualized for you to apply for it, but it, it's unclear what can count and what cannot. You're going to have to work with your lender and the specifics of that. For a new business less than a year that doesn't have historical numbers, does it cover? Um, yes. So there is, it, it, this doesn't apply to a lot, so we didn't, a lot of folks, so we didn't include any here, but there is another um, time period for new businesses. Um, to get the calculation for the Paycheck Protection Program. And I think new, but don't quote me on this, new businesses qualify for the IDLE program, but, um, but you have to look into that. It's certainly, there's, an, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a bucket and a way to calculate your average monthly payroll for new businesses, and they allowed for that in the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, C3s do qualify. Uh, C6s do not. Um, Joe, you seeing anything else? I'm seeing a lot of repeats here. Franklin, I see this <clears throat> same one about are the $100,000 salaries and above completely excluded or for forgiveness or just the amount above 100000 so yet again, wait for final guidance on, on this. It's going to come today and, and work with your lender. But um, the way it's written, it, the 
those that make above hundred thousand dollars will be excluded from the forgiveness calculation from the amount. So you can, you can pay yourself if, or you can pay your worker, hey. your manager who makes over a hundred thousand dollars. It's just going to turn into a traditional, oh it does not go towards forgiveness. And yet again, this was set up this way because they are going at 99,000 in debt. And whether they, they, they're paying you through unemployment insurance or through you, the employer, that's who they're really trying to target and put money in, in the pocket of. So I'm asking, I'm saying, can you state again where we can find the list of lenders? Um, so it was reported in the Washington Post. Uh, I think it was last night, the days were running together, last night at like 11 o'clock, maybe it was the night before, that um, SBA was going to have a map up on their website at some point that, that showed all the participating lenders. But that has not popped up yet. It's, it's unconfirmed. You can go to the SBA site now and they will direct you towards lenders. I'm not sure how comprehensive it is. Just Googling around myself for the Orlando market, the OBJ Business Journal has a good list of lenders that are already participating in the SBA program. And you should definitely reach out to your existing lenders that you have relationships with. Um, and even if they're not an SBA lender now, SBA is throwing open the gates and really lowering the qualification threshold. Basically, any lender financial institution is going to be allowed to participate in this program. So your lender, even though they're not an SBA lender now, they may become an SBA lender to, uh, to process these, these loans. Emergency bridge loan is separate from PPE and EIDL. Um, and uh, you, you got to work with your your lenders um, or your local resources here to kind of figure out the differences in those programs and what makes sense for you. So Tim, we're, uh, we're over our hour. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I don't want to close this out and, and, you know, what are next steps? And we have lots, you know, hundreds of questions here and uh, you're going to talk about a process for helping, helping your folks get those answers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Joe and Franklin, thank you very much. Also, Mayor Dyer, thank you uh, for your leadership during this time. You know, we are uh, accumulating all the resources as they become available. Uh, you can see on your screen, if you go to orlando.org slash COVID-19, that is where we're pulling all the information. So information about um, these SBA programs that we talked about today, the tax credits. Uh, we've also asked our law firms and accounting firms to submit their guidance on, on these new programs as they come out. So as we get them, they're being added to the site. So if you, if you wanna go now to this site, you, you should be able to find a lot of guidance from law firms, accounting firms, um, more information um, that was uh, reviewed today about these programs is also there. In addition, uh, Franklin did mention, you know, different uh, local governments and utilities and banks making special considerations during this time. As we get that information, we're also posting that. It's in the business assistance part of the website. So really take a minute. Um, this isn't a site with a lot of links. It's a site with a lot of content. And we're, we're really culling through everything that's out there to make sure that it's the most relevant. So that's uh, where to go um, for more information. In addition, uh, we've also launched a social media campaign because. Uh, people need a way to chip in and to support small businesses. So if you use the hashtag pick up Orlando and then challenge some friends to do the same. So whether you're, you're picking up food, you're picking up um, dry cleaning, you know, you're just picking up a neighbor, you know, all of these things that, you know, are positive um, movements uh, to support one another uh, during this time. Uh, I think if Orlando has figured anything out, um, it is certainly that working together together is better. And that's what we're trying to do through this, this time period. So thank you all for, for joining in. Thanks again to Joe and to Franklin and to Mayor Dyer uh, for their time and expertise today. And uh, we'll be back with more in this webinar series. Thank you.